Uh, give a round of applause to Sean Ryan, Ashley Asadi, Cindy Drake, and David Guest. Over to you, David. Hey, guys. Hi. How is everyone today? Good. Welcome to the call. Um, exciting day. We've got a few people here today. We've got a few more coming on board, and uh, we've got a pretty exciting topic. So um, I suppose I'll just see if I can get my magic to work. Um, nope. Yay, look at that. Today's topic, average to awesome. So we're going to be talking about how do we take our client base from average to awesome, or how do we take our communications, more importantly, from average to awesome. And uh, we've got three presenters that we're going to be talking about today. But before we get into it, I just want to talk a little bit about Outcomes Business Group. So um, Lorena, myself, and Cindy work with Outcomes Business Group. We've been going for about 20 years now. Um, our job in life is simple. We reinvigorate the business stream. And what I mean by that is we help people take their business to the next stage, right? I've met too many people who run businesses who get stuck. And what we like to do is encourage people to grow their business dynamically, well, and in a leveraged way. So today we're going to be talking about a few things. But before we start, I just want to get an understanding of which business you're in. Because for me, as a business coach for 20 years, I've noticed that a lot of people <clears throat> are working really hard. Whenever I ask them, how's business going? They tell me it's flat out. It's a pretty common thing that they tell me. And usually what they say is, you know, we do our admin when we can, or sometimes we get our partner to do it, or sometimes we do it at night. And generally speaking, the marketing side or the marketing side of the business is low level. Oh, by the way, in the chat box, while we're talking today, if you would be so kind as to put your name and your business and your contact details, if you'd like, uh, just for networking purposes, let us know a bit about who you are and what you do. Throw that into the chat box so that everyone else can read and potentially connect with you um, as we go through the presentation. Um, so what we end up seeing is we end up seeing this dilemma, right, where the business owner is working in the business. And there's many different people that talk about how this occurs and why it occurs. But <clears throat> the reality of this situation is that people get stuck. And what I mean by that is if you try and grow a business where you're the center of the universe, you're going to run out of capacity. Now, that's fine when you're self-employed and you're getting started and you're just trying to build your business. But as your business grows, uh, you'll get to a point where you can't take on any more work. And that's one of the reasons that marketing bubble is so small. Because when I ask people, how come you don't do more marketing? Usually the response is, I'm too busy. I don't have any capacity to take on new clients or I'm just looking for a few. So what we need to do is rethink how we run our business into the future. The ideal business looks a bit more like this, right? There's operations, there's administration, and there's marketing and sales, which is all in even proportion. But here's the major difference. This is what's called working on the business. This is when you become an architect of your business and you design a business that people can work in. So you're creating jobs. You create a business that actually creates a profit rather than just a wage and that allows you to scale. So we're going to be talking a bit about how you can do that through three different channels today. <clears throat> the, the main message of today is awesome communication. Now, most of you are in lockdown and if you're in Victoria, if you're out of Victoria, you're sort of lucky. Right, But what it means is we've been using this channel of communication, the video channel, more than ever. And the beauty of this is that it's a great channel, right? And I wish I could have used it a year ago, but people say, oh, look, I'd rather catch up face to face. I'd rather see you at a breakfast. And we had to accommodate that and the costs were horrendous, right? Um, but the truth of the matter is it's forcing people to become better communicators. And I think in a time when people are using online communication, because all of you can go and check your email right now, you can go and check if the kids are all right, you can do all sorts of things, you'll get distracted. So how do we become awesome communicators and how do we make sure that when we're conveying our message that people are listening? Well, there's three building blocks we're going to talk about today. The first one is making sure that your message is consistent. And when we talk about message, we're talking about brand and we're saying, how do you make sure that people associate all of your communications with what your company represents? So we're going to be talking a bit about that one. The second one we're going to talk about is how do you then get clients engaged using this message? So how do you make sure that the clients are seeing you the way that you expect and see value in your message and value in your business? And the last one, which is the one that really helps us leverage a business or get out of working in the business is how do we communicate with our team? How do we find the right team members? How do we lead them to want to come with us on that journey? So they're the three messages we're gonna go through with our three presenters today. Now, I'm hoping that you guys have got some pen and papers, pens and paper with you, or you can type if you're on the computer, that's all cool, because we're gonna go through a lot of information today. There's gonna to be a lot of notes that I'd like you to take, and we're gonna try and make sure that this time that you invest with us today is worth its weight in gold. 
So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our first presenter. Uh, let me get back into the right camera. Yay. Is that me? Awesome. Um, our first presenter today is Sean Ryan. Now, Sean Ryan is a branding expert. Now, we call him an expert because he's been doing it for a while and also because uh, he's good at what he does. But he's going to be talking about why branding is so important and how that's really the centerpiece of your communication. Now, for some people, they're pretty comfortable with how their brand's represented right now. For others, it's not something they've considered at all. In terms of their communication, what they've been thinking about is how do I actually get some clients or how do I communicate better with my team? But I'm going to hand over to Sean so he can explain some of the distinctions and some of the important aspects of having a great brand. So over to you, Sean. Thanks, David. Let me share my screen and we'll crack on. All right, just let me know if you can see my screen, guys. We're good? Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Sean and I work for a company called About Today. First of all, I'd really like to thank Dave and the Outcomes Group for having me on for this chat. And I'm hoping to give you guys some useful information that might actually get you thinking about why it's really important to consider your brand these days in uh, COVID times. So Eat Your Brand, what is Eat Your Brand? Eat Your Brand is basically a concept we bandy about in the, in the business around having something that is a part of you that is so delicious that everyone will want to eat it, people want to buy from you, and people want to engage from you. Eating Your Brand is really about taking your brand to the next level, putting your best foot forward with all your digital channels offline as well, and leveraging your brand into the core message that you uh, want to project out into, the, um, into your target audience. <clears throat> so a little bit about me. Uh, about Today was founded in 2013. It was under a different name back then. We're actually called Site Marketing Solutions and we were just a marketing company. And from starting with businesses in the marketing space, we worked out that in the online world, marketing is only a very small part of the message that you need to actually put out there. It is a pillar, if you like. And starting with marketing, we would work with businesses who had websites that weren't really congruent to what they were trying to project the sort of clients they wanted to attract the messaging was a bit off and so we facilitated a development arm to the business to help organizations with their websites on as well as their marketing and about three three and a half years ago we branched into a, a full branding uh, agency as well with um a, a, a hiring of uh, a guy called glenn who had 20 who's got 25 years in branding experience because we found once we got into a website that quite often the design was a bit off or the messaging around a new offering was a bit off and there was no consistency and congruency to what the business was and what their online messaging was. And so we, we create a branding side to the business to really start at the start and take organizations through that journey of the brand, a website and a digital marketing strategy to keep everything consistent and congruent, the messaging consistent and it's, it's a fact that if your messaging is consistent and you're consistently putting out the same core values around your business to your target audience, you will actually engage people a lot more. And I've seen it many, many times. So this little slide here, it's about my professional life up the top and then personal life down the bottom. I'm a musician. And the reason I had have this slide here is just to sort of illustrate that a brand is really, it's about people and it's about how people shape the businesses they're in. And it's a culture thing. And the, the power of digital now is that COVID provides an opportunity because everyone has had to move to this virtual kind of world. Uh, you, can do, you can do five meetings a day now. It's really, really easy to actually facilitate a meeting like this and engage prospects through Zoom and Microsoft Teams and all that sort of stuff. But the, if you like the trade-off is there's no face-to-face -face or very little face-to-face -face, face -face gut checks anymore with, with people. Relationships are everything. And that has particularly in Melbourne been taken away from a lot of people. We can't get out. We can't see our clients. We can't network. So all that's really left over and above a call like this or a conversation like this 
is people going and checking you out, checking out your messaging, your LinkedIn profile, your social media profiles, your website, all that kind of stuff. And if there's a disconnect or there's an inconsistency, then that engagement isn't really there. So the message to take away from here is to get your house in order because it looks like things are going to change for good. I'm really hoping we can all get out and have a beer down the pub soon, as I'm sure a lot of you are. But I think the way the business is being done is going to change and brand is going to form a really big part of how people can hockey stick out of COVID and take their communications from, if it was average, hopefully to awesome. So there is the opportunity here is that, you know, change isn't always bad. Change is, is a good thing. Um, there's options. You can shift the narrative. You can readapt. You can reinvent. You can reinvigorate. You can be emboldened. You can change your messaging. Social media and online tools like Google actually offer really valuable insights that you can tap into. The big, well, the interesting thing with digital is a lot of people will throw their hands up and say, oh, it doesn't work. But if you go back 20, 30 years, people would, businesses thought nothing of throwing money at radio advertising or billboards or advertising in magazines, newspapers, all that sort of stuff. Cause that's where people were. That's how they looked for people to engage with, looked for companies to help them with. And basically that was, that was like the old school social media, but there was, it was very difficult to extract insights or any meaningful information out of, out of those mediums. Now with digital and all the tracking stuff that's out there on your Facebooks and LinkedIn's and Google analytics and all that kind of stuff, you can actually really extract really valuable insights from people who are engaging with you online all day, every day. And it is part of the world we live in. Everyone is attached to their computers and their phones and their tablets. And it's not necessarily a good thing. We had a bit of a chat just before this meeting on how pervasive social media can be and how personally a lot of people are you know, pulling away from it, but it's still a really good platform to keep your, your brand out there and just have your brand just popping up every now and then, putting up a feel good story if you've helped a client, a testimonial, a case study, a problem that you help someone solve. That's all really good brand perception for your company if you do it well because you're illustrating how you can solve a problem and there will be someone out there that is probably having the same problem that you've just helped solve for another client and if your branding messaging is consistent unconsciously they remember you i'm sure a lot of us have had instances where clients have come back after many years and they've called you out of the blue and said hey i'm doing this now i need your help again and you might not have spoken to them for six years, but that is, they've remembered you because you've done a good job. And I, I believe it when I say that everyone here would, would want to do a good job for their clients because otherwise, why would you be in business? So the opportunity with COVID and the way things have gone really digital now is to really think about your brand, think about the messaging you put out and maybe rethink the machine gun approach that a lot of people do with their marketing and their website promotions, their EDMs, they just sit there and just shoot, hoping to hit someone. With the insights you can get out of digital and a website contact form, specific landing pages, etc., and specific designs, you can really target a particular avatar into your business. So if you want to target 40 year old single mums, as opposed to 20 year old skateboarders who are male, yeah, you can do that. And it's around the messaging and the design and the functionality and the features of a website and a marketing strategy that will let you do that. So it cycles down to probably my biggest, one of my biggest takeaways from today is you've got to be authentic. Your, your brand is the way that you see yourself and the way that the world sees you. The biggest thing we see when we're talking about a company that wants to reinvigorate their brand or their brand isn't quite working for them, or they just feel like there's a disconnect is stock imagery is used and it's disingenuous. It's been taken off, you know, Shutterstock, it's pixelated. It really has nothing to do with the business itself. People are a bit averse to having their own photos on their website or in their marketing. Whereas you should lean into that. People will buy your face. Like everyone 
might feel a little bit self-conscious about having their photos on their site or talking in front of people either digitally or in face-to-face -face in, the, in the real world. But that's how people buy people. People, people buy people and the business service you're promoting or that you offer is really secondary. These days with the lack of face-to-face -face communications, more and more you've got to appear authentic brand-wise and digitally. And using stock photography that isn't you isn't going to do that. There's a disconnect there and that's just not, you know, people aren't going to engage with you. Your brand needs to be visual, experiential and transactional. Make people want to actually transact with you because you seem like the solution to their problem. And you seem like ethical, authentic, professional people who they will part with money with. And, and money isn't everything. It's about, it's about value. You have to deliver value into your clients and your prospects. And money is just a secondary outcome of all that. And a brand provides structure that guides everything that you do. And what a brand is not, your brand is not your logo. Your brand is not your favorite color. Your brand is more than the sum of its parts and your brand is everything. So what I mean by that is a logo, your favorite color or your core messaging that you might consistently put out there. It might not be enough. A brand is really the umbrella or a concrete slab that you can build your business's house on. So it's, your messaging, it's your website, it's the design of the website, it's how easy it is to navigate through it. If you're targeting a certain type of audience, has the site been designed to really make it easy for them? Is it easy for the call, are the call to actions on the website consistent and valid and targeting your, your um, ideal client? Is your marketing message online correct? Are you using the right channels? Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, they're all very, very different. LinkedIn's more business to business. Facebook is a little bit more socially interruptive and Instagram is a little bit more visual. So if you're a business who's not really in the visual game, then why would you just market on Instagram? If you're a B2B company, LinkedIn's probably the place you want to be, but you've got to really get that messaging correct around your brand for it to stick because your brand really is everything. A little bit of a conversation around us. Site Marketing Solutions was the first company or our first iteration of our company, which was started seven years ago. And it wasn't, it wasn't, it was no longer us. It didn't really present us in a way that we felt was indicative of where we were. So we wanted to represent our present and our future and where we were going. And our new brand needed to reflect the way we see the world. So we, we reframed that and we relaunched it at the start of this year. It was uh, six months in the making for us. But we, after throwing a lot of names around and doing all, this, all the sorts of things that I'm sure some of you have done around colors and logos and all that stuff, About Today was born. And the, the if you like, the uh, impetus for that was it's all about today. It's about taking action today. It's about doing things today. It's about getting your messaging right today to plan for tomorrow and plan for growth in the future. And that change for us has, has really been significant in shifting the mindset of the people we talk to and the prospect, prospects we talk to and our existing client base too. So practicing what we preach and have done for our clients was, was a really great thing to do. And, and um, it's helped us really navigate COVID a lot easier than perhaps we could have if we were sort of stuck in the old ways with our old brand and our old message. So I suppose the, uh, the conversation to have amongst yourselves within your businesses is identify what you stand for, you know, set your foundations, craft your message and really, you know, embrace your environment, embrace where you play, embrace your target audience, set your foundations for where you want to be, where you want to grow to, what avatars you want to target. If you want to actually pivot and do different services, or if you've, you know, merging or you're purchasing another company or you're being acquisitioned, does that reflect where you want to go? And does the brand actually envelop that? Because once you've got your brand sorted, that concrete slab kind of built, you can then start to work out where your messaging needs to be through social media channels, through video, through presentations like this, through blogging on your site, through reaching out to network partners, now, 
it's really about what experience do you want to actually create for the customer when they use your brand? What value does your brand bring to them? You know, you've, you've got to be the safe pair of hands that a prospect feels like they, you are, and they can actually go, okay, I'm, I'm quite happy to part with my time and my money and maybe move away from an incumbent because I believe in these, these guys, they seem genuine. They seem like they know what they're doing. They've got the testimonials and the case studies to, to back it up, which is something I would really, really, really encourage you all to do is get case studies and testimonials from your clients. If you've solved a problem in a really, in a way that was over delivered or even just made the client feel great, feel good. Or even if you just solved the problem, shout it out, post it out there because that is such a good way to really differentiate yourself from the competition because the fact everything is now digital online competition is everywhere. And with everyone using stock photography, everyone, everyone using template designs for their website, everyone using cookie cutter approaches, there is no real way to stand out from the crowd unless you really tackle it from the ground up which is, which is the branding side of things. And so for us with about today, we now feel like we can interject into the three stages that we actually perform in our business, which is the branding website development and the marketing, because we started at the top and worked backwards and have seen so many instances where, where people have uh, taken that pivot and it's been really for the better because they've considered everything you know, from the ground up. So as a bit of a parting gift for you guys to get the dialogue kind of going, there's a couple of, I had a, we had a bit of big discussion internally as to how we would um, try and add some value to you guys over this call. And the problem with a brand is it's very much an intangible thing. And it's only once it's seen and delivered and people start talking about it. <clears throat> Excuse me while I just, uh, use my timer. Once people start talking about it and, give you feedback on it. There's no real way to actually, I think, give you a binary ones and zeros a way to really assess your brand. So I thought I'd put some resources up here for you that you can check out. The first one, unsplash.com is a free photography repository. So you can actually go there and find a lot of lifestyle aspirational photography that I think is a lot better than the generic business sort of stuff because aspirational lifestyle sort of things, particularly now when we're in lockdown, is actually really powerful and a really good way to sell a bit of a dream. And the purpose of your brand, your marketing your website is to really get people just to call you on the phone to talk to you. And Ashley's going to cover that in the next topic. But if you're really good at what you do, most people are pretty good closers if they get a warm lead. It's just getting them on the phone. So lifestyle, selling the dream, aspirational stuff is really important. Canva is a really quick way to get some uh, imagery cropped, if you like, to a the sort of size that you might need to put on social media without needing the Adobe suite, which not everyone can A, use and B, afford. Loom.com is a really good little Chrome applet that allows you to record videos really, really quickly via a screen. And um, it truncates them down into very small file sizes so you can share them out and share out the links. These are really great for training is a really great, great to have on your website. If you want to do a case study about something you did, like a, a you know, video blog, really, really useful. And SurveyMonkey is really, really useful to actually get feedback from customers, clients, prospects, even run some advertising campaigns on how people perceive you. Because forest for the trees, everyone is always so close to their own brand, their own identity that they often think they're something, but they're perceived as something else. So uh, a survey or just asking the question of people, trusted clients, friends, people who are a little bit apart from you is a really great way to actually get a perception of how other people see you. That's my presentation, guys. Thank you very much for that. I uh, appreciate your time and um, cheers. Stay safe and thank you. Awesome. Let's uh, give Sean a bit of a hand. Um, obviously, you know, Sean's passion is helping people understand their brand and communicate their brand. It is intangible. I know for me, when I look at a presentation like that, I'm sort of thinking this is very sort of 
creative, but it's important, okay? Because it's not just about, you know, how do we get an email out there? How do we communicate better? I noticed one of the questions in the chat box, and by the way, please throw questions into the chat boxes for the presenters at any time. They probably won't read them while they're presenting, but they'll certainly be reading them in between the presentations. <laughs> um, bless you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, we've got to love this, don't you? Um, at least we don't have to be in the room with you. <laughs> um, but uh, look, the thing here is, Sean hasn't asked you to contact him, but if you would like to have a chat with Sean, I'm going to suggest if you go into the chat box and you just type in the, in the chat box, yes, I'd like to chat with Sean, he's going to offer you some time on the phone. I'm not going to tell you how long, it might be five minutes, it might be half an hour, just to assess your brand look at your current brand message and maybe highlight some of the areas that you need to actually look at. Because I think it's something we don't look at often. And sometimes it's the, it's the glue that stops our communication being really effective. So if anyone's interested in having a chat with, uh, with Sean, now's your opportunity. Just type yes into the chat box so he's aware. Um, and uh, we can then sort of make sure that he sort of makes an effort to sort of contact you out of that. Um, the next thing, and I noticed there was a question that came up. We're about to go into some breakout rooms because we want to integrate some networking so you guys get to meet each other. This is not just about you sitting there passively and watching us all day. So um, I think Lorena is going to take us into some random breakout rooms where you get to meet some other people, have a chat for about five minutes, and then we're going to come back for our next presenter. So Lorena, if you can make the magic happen, I'm going to click my fingers. Oh, we still have some people. Oh, you're back. <laughs> Cindy's in a breakout room by herself, she says. Oh. I've got her in breakout too. She says she's in there by herself. Mm. No? no? I can hear David chatting away to his people, but she just rang me and said, I'm in a breakout room all by myself. Uh, I've got her in, I wonder if she's still, I might just send her, uh, I can't even send her a message. I've got her in breakout two with one, two, three, four, five, six people. It did, it did take a little while. Maybe she, should we message her? I'm just messaging her now saying you in yet. I should have put Tanya. I should have put Tanya in breakout four. And you're white. Actually, no, well, I can just join and see if she's in there. Yeah, just go into the breakout room and see. I'll stay here. <laughs> Yeah, she's in there. She just got a bit frantic because no one had joined yet, obviously, bless her. 
I think it's because, because I had to do it manually for some people. So I think when everyone comes in, I need to create the breakout rooms. Not do yeah, it. I wait until everyone is in. Yeah. Then I create them and then I assign them because this is exactly what happened at 90 Day Planning. And Cindy did the same thing for me. It was like, no, pre allocate them. You can automatically push them. Like That's what she did to minutes, me. <laughs> like five minutes before the event. And I was like, oh no, I've done it wrong. And she's run all these BNIs. And then it just went. <clears throat> and I was like, I'm not listening because she has a tendency to do that. Like give you something to do like two minutes before it starts the event. So I just ignore her now. I just go, awesome, Cindy, thanks. Because I've got the event with her and Ray tomorrow and it'll be the same. She literally did the same thing with me. Like literally yeah, what you just it. said. And she does it from a good place because she thinks she's trying to help him make help. it easier, but she actually confuses you. So yes. yeah, so just go, that's awesome. Thanks, Cindy. Yeah. Um, how many people? So I need to do it when everyone has come in um and then yeah okay that was really funny i'm sure there is another way but for my peace of mind i wait until everyone comes in and then i start assigning them into wherever i want them yeah i think now hopefully with the next breakout room they'll just do it automatically yep um how many people have we got on this event um 24 but four of us so no there's five of us mm. there's five of us so 20 so 19 yeah yeah so i'd like, like to know like how many people um when it's so i was freaking out with the breakout room so when ashley asadi is going to chat i'm going to actually see who's here and like tick them off to see yeah. if it was like which side it was yeah good idea yeah yeah we need to have a look at that because i thought we'd get like 30 people on this event that's what i thought as well but some person someone just came in and she's like i'm so sorry i thought it started at 10 30 and i'm like oh that's okay I'm like so she came in a bit late i don't know maybe some others are coming i don't know well they can't come a bit late because we would have seen them by now yeah oh well oh, yeah if you can when they're in and actually just start ticking off who's actually there and see we'll look at our attrition rate Okay, love. Right, glad you sorted. I'll speak to you later. All right, perfect. Bye. Oh. Anyway, and we're coming back. back everyone. <laughs> uh, you love this technology, don't you? I know. It's awesome. And you sort of halfway through a sentence and you get chucked back out of the room. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. You didn't do it on purpose. Um, I just want to acknowledge there's a couple of questions going through the chat box. There was one, and uh, it was from. Uh, I have to remember. <laughs> It was a question about how many touch points do the presenters need to build relationships? And it's a perfect intro to our next presenter because the short answer is you need a lot of touch points to build rapport, but it's also the kind of touch points that you have. And one of the best touch points you can have is interactive or face-to-face. -face. I think it was Tara. Did you ask that question, Tara? Just wave if you did. 
the question Tanya. about how many touch points. Tanya. Ah, there you go. Tanya, thank you. Uh, just my glasses aren't working so well. But um, the short answer is you need to build rapport with people, definitely. Brand is a key part of that message so you're consistent. And the other part of it is what channels are you using and how are you communicating? Because email is a bit dangerous because it's just words. Video is better because it's words and it's audio and it's video. Face-to-face -face is the best, but sometimes we don't have those options. But we're gonna talk a bit about that with our next presenter. So perfect timing, thanks for the question. If you have any other questions, please throw them into the chat box so that we can try and address those as we go through today's presentation. But our next presenter is uh, someone that we've done a lot of work with in the past, Ashley al -Sadi. Uh, those who know Ashley, just stick your hand in the air so we can see. If you don't know Ashley, you should, because she's an awesome <laughs> cold calling queen, is what she calls herself. And she's probably one of the best people that I've met that actually talks about how to use the telephone better. And when we talk about communicating with clients, you know, one of the problems with email right now is people are getting smashed with marketing materials. Sometimes a telephone is a one-to-one -one conversation that is better than just sending an email and it's live. So I'm gonna hand over to Ashley so she can explain to us a bit about how to get the most out of using the telephone and how to turn your telephone communications from average to awesome. Over to you, Ashley. Perfect. All right, let me just bring this up. So hello everyone. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, David. Um, as he mentioned, I'm here today to talk about how to successfully utilize what I consider to be the most awesome sales tool in your business, and that is the telephone. And probably now more than ever, it has become such a crucial tool for you to use. So I'm looking forward to sharing some top tips on how you can improve, improve or master the art of using the telephone. First, what I wanted to do was give you a little bit of background on me. For those of you who don't know me, as David mentioned, I do call myself the cold calling queen or a better known as, uh, as the cold calling queen. I've been running a lead generation company now for nine years. So I actually found my love of cold calling after I graduated university. Um, I was working for a sales firm and realized I was the only one who loved doing the sales grunt work. So that first half of the sales process picking up the phone, ringing companies to generate business and realizing that there was a gap in the market. If I was the only one that loved it, I decided to start my own business. So fast forward to today, fast forward nine years, the promo Donna has been working with hundreds of companies all around Australia. We generate you know, hundreds, uh, if not thousands of appointments for uh, our, our clients every year. And we also, we are now a team. So I have a boutique sales team of professional cold callers. And combined, I've actually got on the slide here that we've done about 50,000 hours of calling, but it's probably much more by now. <laughs> Along that time though, as well as doing or running my business, the Promo Donna, I have been approached by a lot of individuals and organizations who say, well, Ash, you do this every day. You're on the phone generating new business. Can you teach me how to do it more effectively? So I did start my own brand, as Sean was talking about. I established my own brand um, doing something else that I'm very passionate about, which is teaching people all about the phone and sales. And so I have my own coaching and training solution. Um, but enough about me and what I do. I wanted to now talk to you about, again, how to utilize the telephone right now in business. And I want to start by saying that one reason I'm so passionate about what I do is I believe that if you as a business owner are not constantly prospecting or consistently prospecting, you're putting your business in danger. And I've actually got in the slide here that in this current climate, so in COVID, this is really important. But to be completely honest, pre-COVID, it was just as important. It's paramount that you guys pick up the phone and talk with your prospects or with your clientele. Because I always like to frame it this way. If you rely on a really, um, uh, like a minuscule, a minuscule part of your client base to bring in a large portion of your revenue. So if you have only three or four clients that bring in 70% of your revenue, and I use this example because a lot of my clients fell into this category. 
if those three or four clients for whatever reason walked today so they had to go on hold would you know where your next sales lead is coming from now if you think about that and you suddenly go oh i would have a very um, quiet pipeline or i don't know where my next sales lead would come from that's where the danger comes in the good news is though if you focus your efforts on utilizing the telephone and being proactive you can overcome it and be leaps and bounds ahead of your competition. So let's look now at why there are companies in this current climate who are not only surviving, but are thriving. And I believe it can be attributed to two points. The first and foremost thing is that they know how to use their phone as a powerful business weapon. And the way that they do that is in two parts. The first part is they know how to use their phone to go back and nurture current relationships or past relationships. They also then use their phone to generate new business. So they're very proactive in picking up the phone to actually generate new sales leads. And these are the two things that we're gonna look at today so that you can hopefully take away some tips and tricks to implement and uh, succeed in your business going forward. So as I said, the first part of those successful companies that are thriving at the moment, they're picking up the phone to nurture past relationships or current relationships and to create new leads from that. One thing I wanna raise with you guys is that, is that there are so many companies out there and you might fall into this category that have those old databases lying around. You know, they have boxes filled with, you know, cards that they got through networking events or they have these old spreadsheets that they say, oh, I'm gonna ring them one day and bring them back to life, but it just never happens. Now, the companies that I'm talking about that are thriving, you can bet your bottom dollar that that's what they're doing. They are making sure they have a consistent effort to bring these leads back to life and to generate as much opportunity as possible. Because I will say to you guys that if you fall into that category, get onto those lists. The reason that it's really great to do that is it's like low hanging fruit. There may be opportunities just lying there waiting that you can convert quite quickly. And these are some of the points that I wanted to raise with you guys as to how you can actually bring your leads back to life. So if you've got that old list there, start to clean up the dirty data. And what I mean by that is start to put a resource on there to actually look at, well, do you have the right contact information? Is it still that company name? So with Sean from Site Marketing, you would research and find out it's actually about today. So you need to update all that data, the phone numbers, the decision makers, clean up the data before you actually pick up the phone. The second thing you can do is to get a referral. Now, the wonder of the world these days, as we have gone quite digital, is you have so many platforms at your fingertips that allow you to do things like this. You could jump on LinkedIn, as I tell a lot of my coaching clients to do, jump on LinkedIn to someone that you wanna speak with and add them and explain why you wanna connect. You know, I'm reaching out because I would love to work with someone like you, or I'd love to discuss something about your services, whatever it might be. Get the referral before you actually pick up the phone. And it's not just about connecting with someone, you could actually connect with someone who knows someone that you wanna work with. So those referrals can, can work as well. Research before you start and keep your eyes peeled. Now, this is really paramount because a lot of people say to me, well, Ash, I wanna bring my leads back to life. I wanna follow up, but I just don't know what to say once I pick up the phone. If you do your research, you're going to be able to find things out that again, you can leverage from during your conversations. Not only will you look well-informed, but you'll look professional and you'll probably identify their points of pains or their challenges and how you can help them to overcome it. So again, I'll use Sean as a great example that he rebranded. They became about today. 
So if you're a company that perhaps, you know, can leverage from that, if you can ring Sean and say, look, I, I recently noticed that you did a rebrand. Tell me a little bit more about that. That's why I'm touching base to see how you're going and see what new initiatives you have in place. Get social media savvy. This is also in line with what I'm talking about, that it allows you to reconnect, to do your research, but also to stay front of mind. Now, something that Sean mentioned earlier was that, you know, there's those people that get in contact with you after seven years of having not seen you or spoken to you. And I kind of look at it at the flip side, that if you stay in contact with people on social media, posting, you know, content or blogs or liking their information, you then can leverage from that when you pick up the phone. You can pick up that phone and say, look, I, I saw on social media recently, you did this, this and this, and I'd love to talk further about that. Do something unexpected as well. If you want to bring your leads back to life, some of my clients will do cute things like sending gifts or, you know, designing some beautiful packages and sending them out. And again, it's just a conversation starter and something that you can use so you don't just sound like that old salesperson who says, oh, I'm just calling to touch base. Have a reason for the call. Now we looked at those companies that were thriving and as I said, component kind of one with them was that they're nurturing their old databases, bringing them back to life. But now the other side of it is that these companies are also using the telephone as a powerful tool to generate completely new leads. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, I'd love to fit into that category. I'd love to start using the phone to generate new opportunities. The first step in your process should be to define your ideal client. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, well, Ash, this is pretty common sense stuff. I know who my target market is. But do you? Because a lot of people that I work with love to fall into that category of saying, well, I want to work with everyone. And unfortunately, that doesn't really work in sales. You really have to define what your niche is. And I'll also add at this point that when COVID hit in particular, this was one of the key exercises for my clients at the Promo Donna because a lot of them got nervous and said, if we call people, won't we be seen as insensitive or what if we can't help people? I said, well, we need to pivot. We need to look at your ideal client. We need to look at the companies that are either unaffected or are affected that you can help. And then we need to build a list around that. So define your ideal client, look at the demographics and the psychographics. So not only the company criteria, the size of the business, the decision maker, but what are their likes? What are their dislikes? And from that, again, you can start to build a new list of people that you wanna target. Now, once you've actually defined that ideal target market and you've started to develop a list, you then have so many different lead generation and action points that you can implement to start generating new business. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, you, know, you can use the social media side of things like email marketing, blogging, uh, video marketing, event marketing. These are starting to generate new opportunities for your business. You can also use outbound or cold calling. Obviously, I'm going to have the preference and say, or be biased and say, I definitely think you should do this activity because it still works. And if you implement all of these things, you'll start to generate new leads for your business. And you can then use the telephone to start to follow them up and convert them into the opportunities you're looking for. What we then come to, so you're probably sitting there thinking, okay, Ash, this is great. You know, you've taught me that the companies that are thriving, they're nurturing their databases or they're defining, you know, the new leads and they're using all these online uh, strategies or cold calling strategies to generate new leads. But what if I want to jump on the phone and start to talk to people? What do I say? So I wanted to use the last um, part of my presentation to talk you through the sales process that we use at the Promo Donna every single day. 
So this is the process that we use every time we pick up the phone to generate the opportunity that we do. The first step in our sales process is all about preparation. Now, preparation is all about mindset, you know, mastering your sales mindset, because I believe that if you don't prepare yourself mentally, you will not generate the results that you want. It's as simple as that. I always like to say that it's the biggest mindset game out there, sales, and it's probably why I love playing it. <laughs> So the tips that I'll give you and that I give my team all the time are number one, write down your goals and targets for every single sales session you go into as if you've already achieved it. So if I'm going to pick up the phone today, I will write down on a piece of paper, I generated three appointments for XYZ client and I'll write one, two, three down the page and my mind starts to filter for the opportunities that it thinks it's already created. So this is really powerful stuff, but again, most people don't write it down and that's why they don't get the results they want. Also, visualize the kind of person that you wanna be perceived as by your prospects or clients when you're on the phone. And I'll give you a quick example here of when I started cold calling, I was naturally quite good at it, but my boss said, Ash, he sounds a little bit like a young girl and I don't know if you have any authority. <laughs> I said, well, what do you want me to do about it? Because I am a young girl. I was about 19 at the time. She said, listen to the upward inflections in your voice. You always go up at the very end and you're asking, sentence, you're asking questions. And so I thought, well, what am I going to do to sound authoritative? And I decided to train my voice or model my voice on someone with authority. And it was actually news reporters. So Ashley El Sadi, National 9 News. They talk down with authority. And the reason that this had become so crucial for me is that people now always say, Ash, you have such a great phone voice. It's not an accident. So that's a tip from me. Visualize how you want to sound and perhaps model your voice uh, to achieve what you want. Now, preparation, I, I talk about the mental factor of it all. But you also, before you get on any call, you want to prepare yourself with an understanding of your products and services in relation to what your prospects want. Now, what I mean by this is most people that get on the phone, they want to talk all about how great they are, their features, their benefits, why they're fantastic. Well, guess what, guys? Prospects just don't care. They want to know the what's in it for them. So a tip here is you have to understand the needs and the challenges of your prospect and how you're going to help them. So they, these are the things you want to hone in on and prepare yourself with. So write down, how have you helped your clients? What are their needs and challenges? And highlight that with the prospects you talk to. Your introduction, now your elevator pitch, this is pretty straightforward, but make it clear and concise. I've seen so many of you typing in things in the chat box, you know, who you are, what you do. You've only got about one or two sentences to capture someone's interest on the phone. So after you've prepared yourself, you pick up the phone, you've got that 10 to 15 seconds to spruit. This is who I am, this is what I do. Make it unique, make it different. Think about your competition. How do you set yourself apart? And again, bring in that preparation component I was talking about that it's the what's in it for them. So how are you helping your prospects? This should be part of your elevator pitch. As we step down through the process, the next step is key questioning. So once you've done a great spiel on the phone, your job as a salesperson or a cold caller is simply to ask great questions. Now, this is my top tip for today. If you take nothing away from my presentation but this, I'll still be very happy. <laughs> so write this down or note this down on your laptop. The person who talks the most in a sales situation is losing the sale. Now, think about that. So many people jump on the phone and think, oh, I've got to bombard people with information. No, it's the opposite. Simply ask great questions. So again, after you've done your pitch, ask open-ended questions like, tell me a little bit more about your sales process. 
Tell me what you currently do to generate new leads. Open up that conversation. Steer away from closed questions because they're a bit like a white rabbit. People will run away and say no. <laughs> so after we've asked some great questions, you will inevitably get some objections that come up. And a lot of people think, well, an objection is a rejection. No one wants to really, you know, hear them. They think that, you know, maybe it's, um, you know, maybe it's someone saying that they're not interested. But the thing that I would like to point out with objections is that me and my team see them as simply a request for more information. They haven't yet seen the value in what you provide. And this is your opportunity to do so. Now, my top tip with objection handling, what I'm going to tell you is that it is always best to put your objections up front. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you are sitting there thinking, well, I always get that objection, they've already got a provider. Now, that is one that's commonly used with our clients. So someone will say, oh, I've already got a provider. I'm not interested. What you can do is put that up front. So if I call someone and I say, I'm calling for a signage company, I might say, Look, my name's Ashley Alsadi. I'm calling from XYZ Signage. We're a signage manufacturer and installer. I understand that as a business, you may already have signage in place and you might already have a provider. But we also find that a lot of companies review this. Can you tell me a little bit about your process when it comes to signage? Do you see how they then can't put that objection up front anymore? I sound a little less pressured because I understand their current position and I've opened up the conversation for them to tell me if they have a need or if there might be one further down the track. So put your objections up front. That's a, a top tip with objections. And last but not least, we come to the close. So if you're on the phone and you've done great preparation, you've done a great pitch, you've answered or asked great questions, uh, handled objections, you should inevitably come to the close. It's a great outcome for us at the Promo Donna when someone says, well, tell me what's the next step? Can we make an appointment? What should we do from here? We know we've done our job. But if they haven't, you can use techniques like the now or never close. You know, if, you know, and the now or never close is something like if someone asks you for a discount, or something of that nature. You can say, well, look, I'd be willing to offer that, but we need to move forward today. The now or never close. The other one might be the hard close where you're very prepared to convert people there on the spot. And there's so many more different techniques that you can use uh, you know, for the close, but I will leave it at that because I know we're running short on time. Uh, but I hope that that sales process step-by-step step, has uh, you know, enabled you to take away some top tips that you might be able to implement if you're thinking of, again, re, uh, you know, revising or um, bringing your leads back to life in old data, or if you're honing in on really creating some new leads for your business. Now, I'm trying to go to this next slide. Let me see here just to wrap things up. I don't know why I did that. Here we go. That's what I wanted to finish on. Oh, it's still not going to do it. <laughs> Murphy's Law. But anyway, thank you so much, guys, for your time today. Um, the last slide was going to just ask a question of, you know, if you have thought about your own sales process and you're thinking, well, there's some gaps in mine or there's some things that I might need some assistance with from Ashley, I'd love to offer you a bit of a review of sorts. We can have a discussion over the phone and run through any of those elements I was talking about that you might be struggling with. Uh, feel free to reach out and connect with me. And I think, again, my key message from my session today is pick up the phone reach out to your prospects and your clients right now because that human to human connection is needed more than ever. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ashley. Let's give her a hand. You'll notice I've only got one hand today. The other one's in this, in this <laughs> <direction. laughs> Yeah, Thank look you. awesome. You know, I've seen that presentation so many times, but you know, I think sales is one of those things you constantly have to review. You constantly have to be rethinking. And the fundamentals don't go away. They just need to be reviewed and reminded all the time. So please, if you're interested in having a chat with Ashley, just throw a yes in or please contact me in the chat box. 
I'm pretty sure that she's going to be sort of following up with people who are interested. Um, obviously, you know, learning how to sell or becoming better at sales is critical for success in business. And the phone is one of those tools that people are scared of. And I think once you've got the confidence to use it, not to be intrusive, there's one saying I often use is you want to be a welcome guest, not an annoying pest. And using techniques like what Ashley's just talked about is really about getting some great rapport over the telephone and making sure you're building those relationships. So please, if you'd like to have a chat with Ashley, let her know in the chat box. We're going to go to breakout rooms for another short networking session before our next presenter, Cindy Drake, who's going to be talking about how to lead the team using sort of awesome communication. So let's go to the breakout rooms. It's going to be random. You don't know who you're going to end up with, but let's go back to, out to those and we'll be back in a few minutes. that one happens a lot quicker. All right, eleven, nine, six, five minutes, and seven, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven.
and welcome back. <laughs> I think we're just waiting on a few more people. They should. Yay! We're back. We're all back. There we go. You're getting this chat room thing really sorted out. Yeah. <laughs> Bit of randomness. I didn't get cut off halfway through my sentence this time, so I'm pretty excited. We saw uh, it coming. Very good. Used to it. I mean, uh, it'll be nice when we can all catch up again, but uh, you know, at the moment, this is just the awesome, awesomest way we can keep the channels open and actually do a bit of networking. So I've met a few people I haven't met before, and I've met some people from the past, which has been fun. Um, look, our next presenter, and I, and I do want to sort of touch on this because it's so dear to my heart, is, you know, I think when people go into business, they go into business for all the right reasons. And one of the issues that I've seen and one of the reasons I became a business coach in the first place is I watch so many people who go into business with dreams and visions of, you know, how they want to grow their business. And they end up doing this thing where they go into a job. You know, it's self-employment. They call it a business because legally they're registered with an ABN, but they end up working harder than they ever have and sometimes for less money than is legal. And this is a bit of a travesty when it comes to running a business because I think sometimes we forget that building a business is not just about getting busy. Building a business is about growing a team, building a product, building a service, and sort of working out a way that you can actually create a profit rather than a wage. So we talk about building the team and people get terrified. Because I think part of building a team is actually paying wages, which is going to be one of the most expensive things in business. And when we pay those wages, there's risk associated with that because we're dealing with other humans. So I'd like to switch to Cindy Drake, who's going to be talking about how to become an awesome leader in your business and how to inspire people. So let's switch over to Cindy. Hello, hello. So let me just get this up right. There we go. So today, are you feeling average or awesome? And do you feel like you have the strategies in your business to fill that bucket to be an awesome leader? Hello, my name is Cindy Drake and I'm a business coach with Outcomes Business Group. And I started working in business at the age of 13 with mum and dad. We had a petroleum business. We were a wholesaler and a retailer. Dad used to drive the big tanker truck dropping off fuel to the service stations and mum and I used to work in the service station. So um, our family was very much family business orientated, but it broke our family up. So my business now is really to help business owners improve their lives or businesses um, by making it better. So we do that by starting with a purpose and having a vision, um, understanding how to work with teams and different personalities understanding the numbers and how to make a profit and creating systems that are really easy for business owners to use. So most importantly, I help business owners have the right perspective in business through the good and the bad times. So today I want to talk about leadership and more than anything, just give you inspiration to think about what your leadership role really means and how you can rise above average for yourself and people around you. So just to get a little bit more interaction and engagement, because I love doing this. Leadership. Um, what does leadership mean for you? And can you pop your answers in the chat box? Let's get some clarity here about, let me just get the chat box up. What does leadership mean for you? And what's your definition of leadership? I'd love, love to get all 20 answers in here in the chat box, uh, just to see the common themes that come through. Please don't make me play music to actually sit here and wait. But what do you think leadership is? Give me your definition. No right or wrong answers. Beautiful, empowering people. And if you see the words there, just repeat them again so we know what are the themes. Inspiring people. Having a vision. Love it. Direction. Stepping up and putting yourself out there. Leading. Providing direction. Great, encouraging people, understanding your markets. So and now we're starting to see the, um, the themes coming through. Being willing to listen, do not be the boss, supporting people to form at their best. Fantastic. Thanks for sharing. Um, that's really awesome. In terms of traits or different characteristics that take you from being average to awesome, what do you think would be a really good characteristic for a leader to have? Listening, love it. 
being authentic. Communication skills are a big one, isn't it, in leadership? Empathy, resilience, Aries, innovate. Nice. And guidance, transparency, leading by example, awareness. Thanks, guys. They're awesome answers. And I think all of these are really important. And um, today, what I'd really like to focus on with you are these traits. It's having these today. I think these are the important traits to really get you through the times that we're going through. And for a bit of a who am I? So if you know who this person is, just pop the answer in the chat box. But with this person, um, I was born on the remote station of Glengarry in Western Australia in 1861. Both my parents were from original settler families who were well connected and quite conservative. I lived a happy life until about the age of seven where my mother passed away, along in childbirth, along with the baby. My siblings and I were separated and I was sent to boarding school. Here I developed a strong, strong will and became very self-sufficient. At 16 years, my father descended into alcoholism, depression and despair following the death of my mother. My father shot his second wife through a domestic um, dispute. He was charged with murder. He offered no defence and he was sentenced to a hanging. This emotional effect and shameful death rippled through generations in our family. At 18 years, I married a public servant who later became a magistrate. I followed my husband's career, studying the sad and sorry cases that daily walked through his courtroom. Alive to the injustices created by poverty and lack of education, especially for girls and women, I felt the need to actually do something to relieve these distresses. I became an so Australian social reformer who worked for the rights and welfares of women and children. I became the first Australian female to serve as a member of parliament I was awarded an OBE and I featured on the Australian $50 note. I am Edith Kerwin. So pretty crazy way to start life, right? But Edith was known for her resilience, her perseverance, her humility, untiring energy and indomitable courage. She's on the $50 note for a reason. She was a true leader, paving the way for social injustices. She had a tough start to life, but she didn't use that to become a victim in life because of a personal tragedy. Tragedy. She used her lessons to become a stronger person, making meaning out of what gone on to be able to build on the strength and help other people. When you think about her timing of influence in Australia with the social injustices back there, I'm imagining it was a pretty tough fight to get through a male dominated environment. And it probably makes me feel exhausted just thinking about it, but it's not my fight. It was her fight. It's what she believed in and it's what she stood up for. So we're going through tough times right now. And there's no doubt that in Victoria, we are being beaten up. There's emotional stress going on out there, family stress, economical stresses. And it's not about whether or not this is affecting you because at some point it will but it's how are we responding to the situation. Today, our country needs leaders. And is your vision big enough to get you out of bed in the morning? Are you being impacted by COVID or are you getting busy creating a vision and sharing it for the future? This is where I start with every client. It's having a purpose and knowing how you contribute to the world. A trait that Edith had and was pretty big on was resilience, which means when it feels like it's falling to pieces, you're either growing or shrinking, just like this flower. Resilience is about the ability to cope, adapt and bounce back when things are tough. How we view stressful moments will strongly affect how you succeed. And there's three points here that I think are really important. Our perspective on challenge. So do we view the challenge or difficulty as a challenge or do we paralyze ourselves? Do we know enough about the situation? Are we seeing the opportunities for growth? Optimistic people don't view these challenges as a negative reflection on their own abilities or self-worth, but actually find ways to get through it. 
The second thing I think is really important to practice for resilience is what's in your control. Resilient people won't focus on the things they can't control. They'll focus on the things they can control. Because when you put your energy and effort to what you can't control, it becomes highly stressful and exhausting. So focus for your efforts where you have control for best return. Commitment. Resilient people are committed to their lives and their goals. They're, they plan, they make a commitment for what they wanna do. They get out of bed every morning, make their bed. They're committed to their family, their business plan, their happiness and health goals, their communities and spiritual beliefs. Who or what are you committed to today? Now is the time to be resilient and get clear about the kind of life you really want. What are you working towards? Or are you just floating around being busy for the sake of it? Being resilient can be done by taking control of our lives. And remember, we're all humans and we do trip up on this stuff. We will drop down below the line, but it's about the ability to bounce up and pick up and empower yourself again. We are really going through interesting times right now and people are feeling beaten up. It's not how tough the environment is, it's how tough is your leadership. Leaders are being born through these times. You're either standing tall and owning your future or you're sitting down being swallowed up by the environment. It's, it's about empowering yourself and those you influence. And ways to do that is to keep your future line of sight within vision. Make sure you've got a vision board, you have your goals in front of you, if you need affirmations, but have goals that you work towards for a personal, business, family, financial perspective. The critical thing here is don't make your goals so far-fetched that you feel like they're unachievable. The goal should be something you want to work towards and drive you and pull you with momentum. Your language here is going to be critical. Because if you keep thinking about the past, if you keep thinking about this language here at the bottom about what you should have done, what you could have done, the stuff you can't control, that's the stuff that will drive you into anxiety. So stay forward and focused around what can you do today and how can you get to the next day? Be empathetic and kind to yourself when people are going through change. Because it's um, having healthy relationships here will help you stay above the line. Learning is essential for growing. When you, when you grow, you feel alive. So make sure that you have something that you're learning constantly on your journey in life. And creative learning is a great way to make sure that you're seeing the world differently. Self-care is an essential. Making sure that you exercise, have healthy eating habits, sleep and meditate are some of the foundations that will help you stay healthy. And make sure you have a support team where you've got at least three people around you who share the same vision that you have and will help you stay upright instead of sit down. Another trait for awesome leadership during these times is being adaptable. Because um, this means that you can change and be flex flexible in our world today and tomorrow. So technology is moving streaks ahead and it's changing the way we do business. Are you embracing these changes or resisting? Every leader has the capability to be a leader, but sometimes they just need a little guidance or support to help them shine or stand that little bit taller. There's lots of changes going on and with lots of changes comes the potential for lots of heightened emotions on these journeys. Can you remember the announcement of COVID, the panic buying, the COVID updates you had to keep listening to, or even the recent lockdowns? How did you respond? Where were your emotions? There is an emotional wave pool out there with people this year. They're going through different emotions at different times. So to lead the process of change, first we need to really understand how do we respond to these changes ourselves? What are the behaviours that we're going through? And how can we communicate without the emotions taking over? So to help us through this, Let's understand a little bit more around the change process. There is a process to change. Ta-da! There's four stages to it. So to be more adaptable, it's good to understand these changes and the different emotional cycles that we go through. So the first stage is around the breaking the status quo and going into shock or denial. 
I don't know if you can remember when COVID was still first coming into Australia, I think February, March, when we, it was coming around here, it was around the rest of the world, but how it impacted Australia took a little bit of it, um, a little bit of a reality check, I think. So how did you first, it, were you in shock or denial when you first started hearing COVID? Then you went through a bit of a disruption throughout that phase. And this is where the emotion comes in. People start feeling anger and fear. Then we go through a bit of exploration through the next phase. And this is about slowly starting to accept it and understanding how we can play in that space. And then you go through rebuilding. And this is how you start committing to the new way and you start embracing it with your business. So why do you need to understand this? Well, how can we understand it to manage this process in our business better? So when you're in the shock and denial stage at this first step, what you need to do as denial creeps in, we really need to be um, keeping people fully informed about what's going on and encouraging conversations to help people digest the information. People need time to adjust to the new news or understand what's being said, but be careful of where you're getting your information from. Look for credible and factual sources because nothing spreads faster than bad news on media and social places. Don't overwhelm people. Overwhelm people, remember they can only take two to seven chunks of information. The second part of the stage is the real, where the reality really starts kicking in and the emotions start going crazy. People are going to um, start fearing the impact. What does this mean for me? What, they'll start fearing all the unknowns they don't know. There'll be anger that pops up and some even actively resist or protest against these changes as you're seeing in our community with lockdowns. Can you remember how you felt when the news of the lockdown being extended, how devastating it was? So during this phase, it's great to create some level of awareness of emotion and really help people through that emotional intelligence. So to do that, um, people need to have clear communication and support. They need to be able to, um, it's going to be a very personal journey, so they need time to process it at the personal level. And you provide a supportive environment. This is a real game, game changer in your business. And you can do that by providing some private time for chats one-on-one um, -on -one with people. Just being an ear to listen to. Sometimes people just need to be able to talk it out so that they can process it. Don't push them for answers and don't make assumptions based on gossip. So while resisting the change, people who are um, being disruptive or stressful in these times can really make it unpleasant for individuals who are slowly starting to accept it. So the best thing you can do is help your team progress and move into the next phase so that they start moving towards the acceptance. Now, in the acceptance phase, this is where people start having a sense of hope, of acceptance and optimism. So it starts giving them a brighter perspective. And now that we know that lockdown is really going to be eased because the stats are coming down, it's got to, <laughs> you start having hope personally, and it starts changing your perspective and how you start giving off energy. So during this phase, people really need the time to actually be able to play, um, test and explore. What do these new changes mean for them? How can they contribute differently into your business? Do they need support and training? Um, and give them time to go through the process of learning because trying to push the learning will hinder the learning process. So it doesn't mean 100% buying yet, but it does provide a healthy platform for testing and playing and working out what could this mean for your business. So when people have the chance to explore and operate, then they start to embrace the new methods and you rebuild their way of value within the business and they start contributing in a new way. Then you get to the last stage where you can really start benefiting from the change. And this is, um, it becomes second nature and you start seeing the benefits and improvements. The team is starting to become more productive and it's worth, you've got to celebrate these times. So many times we get too we're caught up in the busyness of business. We don't stop and celebrate enough, but you need to celebrate and look at the reflections and learnings that you went through in that change so that you can build and grow to a new level when you have to go through change the next time as a team. Now, the lockdown is a classic example of this, but this is what can really happen in your business. So this is where you're not trying to manage the process is a longer drawn out kind of process. But when you're there providing help emotionally for people and helping them get through the process, then you can get through. So humility is another classic trait that's really important for business owners. And it's, um, it's really letting go of the ego and thinking about how do we help others? 
So this image, someone influenced the other to get that bucket of water, right? Someone saw the need for water in their little town or community. And um, how are we looking out for what the world needs now as results? What are people needing right now? We often tend to think that we need to keep serving them and filling our own bucket, but what are people actually needing? Again, it's about your perspective. So someone had to lead one or the other here to go grab that bucket of water, but don't you just love the way they're smiling and laughing and joyful about doing a chore? Does that vibe resonate for your workplace? So tips to remain humil or practice with humility is don't say you're humbled, just be humbled. Um, giving credit to others instead of knowing everyone has that no, instead of everyone knowing that you're the influencer. Owning and sharing a story that connects with people emotionally and taking time to look out for yourself so that you can keep your bucket full to help others. So being an awesome mean leader means that you understand how to lead through changing environments being able to adapt and change and really stay on the game of resilience. Know how to dig deeper to really help people on the emotional game. So Seth Godin here said it pretty well. Um, it's the ability to influence others and that means having a great vision. So I believe that there's lots of frustrated business owners out there through lockdown and uh, feeling frustrated, hurt, and feeling like there's a long battle ahead for recovery. But this is the moment to step up. It's about starting to get ahead today and not waiting for the situation to get better. Get proactive today, make your mark. Today I've shown you some great examples of awesome leadership and traits that can help you through that process. Sometimes you just need a reminder of how your influence could be making a difference out there. So if you feel like you need a boost or would like to play full out and stand just that little bit taller, just like that chicken amongst the ducks. Um, we can start talking about how to change the perspective and lifting the game in leadership from average to awesome. And I agree with you, Ashley, perspective is everything. How we go into that sales pitch and um, owning your brand, just like Sean was saying. Is that the end, Cindy? Ta-da. Awesome, give her a hand. <laughs> What an amazing sort of presentation. I didn't expect us to hear so much value in that. Bloody hell. <laughs> um, well done. I mean, <clears throat> I, think, I think leadership's an interesting space right now because we are looking for leaders in our business community right now. You know, the, the, we're sort of being beat up as a society. We're being beat up as a community. And we're looking for people to stand up and say, I don't need to be beat up all the time. I just need to move forward from this. Just understanding how to be inspired, how to be resilient, how to move forward is critical in moving forward. So look, if anyone would like to sort of take Cindy up on a, on a bit of a chat and just talk about how you're showing up as a leader, uh, you can either type yes in the chat box, you can private message her through the chat box, whatever you, you would like to do. Um, I'm quite conscious of time. We're coming towards the end of our presentation. There's probably two things that I'd like to do. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just quickly, if I can make my computer do that magic thing again, awesome. I want to talk a bit about, you know, this, this notion of being a business owner. And, and I think, you know, for a lot of people, they love these ideas we've talked about today. But I've watched some people on this call today and they've had to take phone calls. They've had to chase kids around. They've had to deal with client problems, right? And uh, sometimes our world as a business owner is chaotic. You know, we're running around like crazy. We're trying to get forward and all we're really doing is getting dragged back. And it just feels like we're never moving forward. The fundamental thing that a business owner needs to be aware of is how do I move out of chaos and how do I take back control of my business? Now, this is a platform and it involves things like planning. It involves things like productivity. It involves things like using KPIs to drive your business forward. It involves things like making sure you're not losing clients through customer service. But this is the foundation. The second part of this is growth. Now, it's very difficult to grow a business in chaos and I actually don't recommend you do it. If you're chaotic right now, do not grow your business, right? Because it doesn't end well. Growth is about making sure you have a level of control over your business and then you can start investing in things like we've talked about today, getting your brand to market, getting to your clients and starting to engage those new clients on board and even just building your team, right? This is really all about growth, but there is a higher purpose in business. And, and this is for me where we leverage ourselves. Now, leveraging yourself in business is about learning how to build a team so they run the business for you. Now, I know for some people that's altruistic, that's something that's so far in the future that they don't think about, 
But for us in our business coaching world, we often talk to people about what does your business need to look like when it's finished? And what does finished mean for some people? Well, I'll tell you for 80% of Australians, finished means you close the doors and you sell off all of the assets because businesses don't sell in Australia if, there's, if you're self-employed because there's nothing to sell. So what are you building that has asset value within your business in the mid to long term? Forget about COVID, COVID's just a speed hump for business, right? Think beyond it, think five, 10, 15, 20 years into the future. So not just, it's not just about growing your business, it's about building that business asset. And the reason I bring this up is there's a lot to take away out of today. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that through the chat with the, with the, um, with the presenters. Um, actually, we might do that now. I want you guys to do this for me right now. Just going through any notes that you've taken through this session, I'd like you to start just typing in the chat box, what has been the number one distinction or lessons or what are the takeaways that you've taken out of today's event? Because one of the things I've learned is you can sit through an event like this and it can be awesome. But if you don't articulate or clarify what are the key takeaway points, you can walk away from a presentation and I can see it there, Ellen said, great presentation. But let me know specifically, what did you get out of today? So what were the takeaways that you got out of the, each of the three presenters? Now, while we're doing that, I might get the presenters back up on the screen because we're gonna have a bit of Q and A. If anyone has any questions of a specific presenter, now's your chance. I think there was one question really early in the presentation today that I'm gonna ask Ashley to answer. And that was the question around, yes, if you scroll back through the questions, that one about the eight to 10 touch points um, to be successful in building a relationship or making a sale. So we might start with that while we get some comments into the chat box. And uh, let's see if we can get some other questions and some interaction going for the last few minutes of our presentation. So Ashley, did you want to share some sort of information on that, please? Yeah, actually. Um, so when I hear that question, I actually connect it with, we did this uh, a mail out years ago and it was a card to all of our prospective clients about the number of times it takes to follow up to convert a client, right? And it was actually 14. It was 14, 14. times. <laughs> that was one of the, the percentages. Now, in saying that, I don't want you to all freak out and go, oh my gosh, I've got to ring someone 14 times before they convert. But it was a statistic to show that overall, on average, most salespeople had to Call, uh, call and connect with prospective clients 14 times in the maybe longevity of their relationship before they actually converted uh, yeah. into a client. So it's something to keep in mind. I would be saying that that eight, you know, touch points would definitely be true. Mm. And I guess mm. the good news for you too, though, and this is also coming back to the 14, you know, times of contacting them, that wasn't 14 um, necessarily in times you had to actually pick up the phone. It could also be that you called and maybe um, then sent a follow-up email or, yep. you know, reached out to them on social media. Mm. So I would be saying to the person that asked that question, definitely keep that in mind. And for everyone um, in this discussion, that's why we need to, you know, establish a great brand, have a great social media preference, but also pick up the phone, make those follow-up calls and do it consistently because it will take a number of times before you actually are able to, to bring people to fruition. Yeah, absolutely. Great answer. Look, I think I might add to that a little bit. And it's, it's sort of like, you know, when, when we talk about business and uh, building client bases and getting sales, I think sometimes people forget that it is a relationship and we build relationships over time. And we build relationships with prospects, we build relationships with partners, we build relationships with our team members, we build relationships with everybody. And when people get to know, like, and trust you as a business and they understand what your message is, so you're on brand with your message and you're communicating all the time. So it's not about how many times should I contact someone. My, my answer is contact them all the time. As long as you're in business, make sure they know that you're in business and they know what you're doing because then you build a relationship. Because I've had people on my database for 10 years and I've often asked, like, so you obviously receive our emails all the time. They said, yes. And I said, what do you think of the content we send out? And this lady said, to be honest, I've never read them. <laughs> and I said, what? Well, why wouldn't you unsubscribe? She said, David, I just knew one day if I needed you, you'd be in my inbox. And so sometimes it's just about the relationship. It's not about having a pitch. It's about having a relationship. So great question. Look, um, we've got a few other comments in there. You know, make sure your brand is consistent. I think that's a big one. 
you know, um, Sean talked a bit about those three, the three building blocks to, to change, and it's um, really good to have a clear sales process. Um, I want to thank everyone for their time today. There's one last thing I just do want to touch on, and it's, uh, it is something that we do here. Um, if I can make this work again. It's not going to work for me. Oh, it's not going to work. Can't do it. Try again. Hang on. Hey, I'm in the wrong place. Send me over there. Um, I just want to talk about another event. So, so I'm assuming a lot of people got some good sort of value out of today's session. One of the things we've been doing since the COVID lockdown has been running the business adaption plan workshop. It's a round table discussion, a bit like this, but a way more interactive session where we teach people how to identify which part of their business plan needs to be focused on right now. The next one we're running is on Thursday, the 1st of October, and it says $97, but look, anyone who's on the call, if you're interested in attending that event, there's a no charge event for you guys. It's a two hour interactive workshop. So if you're keen in doing that, you just need to say yes in the chat box or adaption plan in the chat box so we know. And that'll just let Kelly or, or it'll let Lorena know to get in touch with you if you're interested in attending that. I suppose the first thing is that if you're available on that day, the 1st of October, 10 a.m., it's two hours. And if you are, just let us know in the chat box and I'm happy to get you there. Um, I just want to sort of wrap up by acknowledging, I suppose, all of the presenters. If I can make my computer work. Hey, I'm back. Um, I just want to acknowledge all the presenters for a great job they've done today because there's been a bucket load of content from each and every presenter and a totally different aspect on what you need to do to turn your communication from average to awesome. So maybe if you want to do some thanks to the presenters by doing a bit of a clap so we can see it, or maybe you can do it in the chat box. I really don't mind how you do it, but these guys have done an amazing job today and I'm really impressed with the quality of what they've done. So I appreciate your attention because one of the most expensive things today is getting people's attention. We've had you sitting in the front of a computer for nearly two hours. So I hope you get some awesome takeaways out of today's session. I hope it makes a difference to your perspective, to your business, to your communication. And I look forward to hearing about your success, guys. So thanks very much for your time. We are gonna hang around if people have got some questions for the presenters. We're gonna do some dancing. I see Ashley's doing this sort of thing. I, and we've never I'm, worked out how to close I'll off nicely. I'll make a nicely. TikTok. I'll make a TikTok while we're on the, make on a the TikTok. presentation. <laughs> Feel free to jump in, arc up, turn your mic on, play some music, do some dancing, whatever you like as people are leaving the call. So thanks very much for your time today, guys. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs> there we go. Oh, we actually are playing music. <laughs> That's Cindy's magic trick. <laughs> I think Lorena's on it all over it today. Yeah. I That's am. Right. Awesome. But it's clean. It's so clean. All right, guys, enjoy your day. For those who are leaving us, um, take care of yourselves. Stay safe, all the things that we say. And I'd love to Thanks, hear a bit more from you in the future. Bye. Thanks, guys. Great session. Appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Thank you. Welcome, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Hey. Love the breakout rooms. I did too. That was fantastic. The breakout Good to rooms? connect with different people yeah. and get feedback. That went quite yeah. well. Fantastic.